My name is Yvonne Stevens and I'm the events coordinator for Island. Island is a small nonprofit organization based in Bel Air and our focus is arts and ecology. We hold events throughout the year including workshops and work bees and, um, and art film philosophy is a series that we share with Parkside Arts Council. We partner together to hold this year round event that hosts um, speakers on various topics and also a film. So each month we have, we have two art film philosophy events on the second and fourth Wednesday. I thought that we'd start off with uh, just doing introductions down the line. I know um, Yvonne introduced all of you, but if you could just talk for a minute or two about what you do. And Rachel Crido, I am on the board of Parkside Arts Council and I run my own graphic design and consulting business here in Bel Air. Um, I guess probably is a lot, the reason I'm here I guess is uh, my, a lot of my research I did in college and grad school regarding art and rural communities. Um, which has kind of led me after graduation to work a lot with nonprofits, uh, AmeriCorps Vista programs, um, and really st start up arts organizations, I guess. Well, I'm Gene Gentleman. I'm the director of the Dennis Museum Center at Northwestern Michigan College in Traverse City. Um, I was hired by the college in 1988 to come here and work with Bob Holdeman uh, from AAI to uh, finalize the designs on a building that already had a concept uh, for it uh, when I came. Uh, we uh, opened the museum in July of 1991, so we're 21 years old. Uh, my background, my academic background is actually in physics and astronomy. I got into the museum world running planetariums and into the art world uh, because my wife to be eventually uh, at the University of Wisconsin where I went to school uh, in Eau Claire was in the art department and uh, in the course of spending time with her in the art department I learned to throw pots and do other things along with her and spent a lot of time in the art galleries uh, at the uh, university and when I entered the museum world in Alpena uh, the uh, art exhibitions in my book were not quite up to the, at the Besser, were not up to the standards I saw in the university. And so after about two years of running a planetarium and talking about the stars, I decided I'd go find some art. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is probably not a good thing to say. I went to Detroit uh, and worked with the commercial galleries in Detroit. And so my whole experience and entry into the art world is one purely of experience and exploration uh, as opposed to an academic training. I'm Lindy Bishop. Uh, I'm uh, the owner of Seed Studio Gallery, which uh, does no longer exists as a retail front. Um, but I, if we're all imaginative enough to imagine that it uh, exists as a service agency um, and also as an online uh, art gallery. Um, I, I also have another job, um, a couple others, but I'll mention a couple. Um, uh, I have um, uh, another job as economic development director for Elk Rapids. And uh, I grew up in the area, <laughs> went away to Chicago for uh, quite a while and uh, was employed in the advertising industry. Uh, always had art as, as, as a love and also as a, a talent and a passion of my own. Um, but it wasn't until about six years ago that I started painting. Um, it wasn't until about uh, three and a half years ago that I moved back to this area and opened a gallery first in Elk Rapids and then in Traverse City. Um, now that I've closed my retail front, uh, it's been really an awesome experience to uh, start developing my own art again and, uh, and painting a lot more. Um, and it's also really an, a, a fun opportunity to be working on economic de development as an artist uh, and uh, as a gallery owner and to see how many of those things do cross over. Uh, it's, um, it's one of the subjects I think that we'll, we might get into today. Um, and the rural part of our country and of our state is always been a passion and a love of mine, uh, having grown up here and attended school with um, friends that are farmers, uh, family members that are farmers, and having the experience 
close at hand to um, be part of all that. It's not just the natural beauty of the water, but the rural areas that I think are very attractive in, in this part of the woods. So that's it. Hi, my name's Glenn Wolf. Um, like Lindy, I don't exist anymore. <laughs> my, my studio doesn't. I, I had a commercial studio in, in Traverse City and, and closed it down, and now I'm working out of my house. But I started um, in New York. I grew up here, started in New York as an illustrator in the 80s, and worked for the New York Times and, and a lot of different publishers, um, the Bronx Zoo and uh, Central Park Conservancy, and I illustrated a lot of books about pasta and the outdoors and all kinds of different things, and also work as a fine artist and um, have collaborated with most of the people up here. Um, and uh, that, that's, that's why I'm here. <laughs> uh, Chad Pastoknik, uh, my, my, my shop is Deepwood Press. Uh, I grew up in Cadillac, and uh, when I went to college, you know, I, that was my goal was to get away, <laughs> go to the city. <clears throat> so after college, I went down to Chicago for a while and uh, got involved with an organization, Chicago Hand Book Binders. And right as I left town, that turned into uh, Columbia College Center for the Book and Paper Arts. But uh, I came up here. Uh, bought my property in 92 and started Deepwood Press, and uh, so which just turned 20 years old last week. Um, uh, and uh, But have been involved in Parkside Art Council, uh, JRAC in East Jordan, uh, quite a few other like uh, Glen Arbor Art Association over the years and have uh, taught and uh, advised and been on boards and that sort of thing. And um, uh, being having a being a publisher of sorts, fine books, um, I've had the opportunity to work with lots of great regional writers and artists, and, uh, and I find that to be one of the, my favorite things. So, um, so I guess that's why I'm here. So, so I like to collaborate and, <laughs> and uh, do fun things. My name is Rebecca Glatfelty, and I moved up here from a town, I grew up in a town of, um, I think, 9,000 people, and moved to a town of 3,000 people, um, which is Charlevoix, and in 2001, I opened up a gallery called the Cycling Salamander Gallery, and I guess it's about the 10th year of having the gallery. Uh, and I also started working with the Jordan River Arts Council soon after moving here. I was recruited <laughs> um, and then have worked. Um, I was the founding president of the Charlevoix Circle of Arts, which was Charlevoix's first, I believe, first art center um, since probably the 1920s that they had an organization based in Charlevoix. Uh, I currently, um, I still have the gallery, but I currently um, am the director of Real People Media, and we got our 501c3 status a couple years ago and what we do is we help people tell their stories through video production digital media and we saw that there was a need in um, northern lower Michigan to provide access to video production equipment where people can videotape meetings such as this um, without having to pay um, for a professional videographer a lot of it is a lot of what I do and what what we're doing tonight can be done by anybody here, it's just having the, the access to the equipment. So that is what I'm spearheading um, right now in Charlevoix. We have a, a media center and trying to get more funding. We just got a $10,000 grant last week, so that uh, helps to provide equipment. Um, so that's sort of um, my love of small towns and rural communities, but try, how do we um, make it work? Um, economically is a big a big thing so um, thank you for asking me to be here thank you for being here and I'll, I'll probably jump in and out <laughs> I'll probably just be behind the camera tonight <laughs> I think I need a redo after what was the role <laughs> yeah after listening to all this I'm already excited for the conversation this is great I, I guess I should introduce myself to um, my name's Amanda Kick I'm the co-director of Island um, <clears throat> One of Island's program is an artist residency program where artists from all over the world can apply to come and stay for two to four weeks in a log cabin um, adjacent to the Mackinac State Forest. Um, they can stay for two to four weeks to focus on their work. Um, 
I grew up in suburban Detroit, went to college in Los Angeles, and was in Los Angeles for about eight years. And when I was preparing to move from Los Angeles to northern Michigan, one of my friends said, well, you know, you can't make art in a void, right? <laughs> and at the time, I kind of scratched my head about that. And I think in the last 11 years that I've been here, it's kind of festered more and more and has been one of my drivers for the arts in this region because this is clearly not a void. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> so anyway, that's why I'm here. Uh, I've got a, a couple of questions to kind of get things rolling, but uh, this is meant to be a conversation. So um, as we go, please feel free to drop questions and ask for clarification, whatever. Um, <clears throat> okay. I asked my husband for some suggestions too for questions, and he gave me a <laughs> So um, I apologize if I kind of go back and forth between the paper. Um, but, but I like this one that he presented. Um, does, does Northern Michigan have an art scene? Do artists here feel connected to a move, movement or, or a cohort? Movement a co or a what? Cohort. cohort. Oh. Lots of cohorts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> These guys are cohorts. And uh, I, I've illustrated, I don't know, five books with uh, a great author from Northern Michigan, Jerry Dennis. And, and I, I, I started my career in New York and worked there for about 10 years, made a living, but didn't feel like I had cohorts or was really connected. But when I got back here, uh, connecting with Jerry and uh, Chad and um, uh, having Gene offer me a show, I think back in 2002, mm -hmm. um, I, I feel there's you know, amazing, amazing connections and, and cohorts. I, I don't know about a movement, because I think we all do our separate things. Um, that's my take. It, there's an art scene here. All you have to do is, uh, I was uh, visiting with my colleague from Marshall Frederick Sculpture Museum uh, day before yesterday, and, uh, and I was t telling her that I was going out state to the Council of Michigan Foundations to talk about the collaboration that formed the nonprofit ticketing operation TREAT for the region. Uh, and uh, we have turned that over to uh, my north uh, or up north publications now and, and, and they do the ticketing for us and so on in the marketing and I, she was interested because she wanted to know what was going on and how we did that in northern Michigan and, and I said well let's go on the website and I can show you and we have an event coming up on the 12th of October with the Golden Dragon Acrobats coming and we proceeded to go through the website, trying to get to that point. The amount of arts events going on <laughs> on the 12th was four pages. Oh my gosh. Leading up to the acrobats in the evening. Is there an art scene here? Yeah. What I think it's, you know, Traverse City, you know, is such a, it's becoming this little hub, but I, I think it's mm -hmm. also bringing all the artists that are hiding kind of help mm -hmm. a little bit more. I mean, we all like to hide. You know, I tend to work business side of art, and you know, my husband is an artist, and I usually have to drag him out of the house. But, you know, when you're talking rural Bel Air, I mean, I think there's a great group of us out here that are all collaborating together, whether it be good or bad. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think, you know, there, there's an art scene, whether it be on a big big level, um, Traverse City very organized and shows going on or hanging out in people's garages. <clears throat> I would say that there's plenty of collaborators but uh, no movement, but mm -hmm. arguably there's no movement in the art world anywhere. So, right. um, you know, everybody, every city has its own little scene, but, uh, you know, there's no cohesive movement going on in the art world since, you know, probably outsider art. So, um, you know, maybe, and we all live up here because we, we, this is what inspires us. We could be back in the urban environment. And uh, so we seek out the opportunities and the people that we need to mutually be inspired by, I think. It seems like there's a, a, a lot of uh, art seen among artists 
and and um, and artist friends. Uh, I don't know in terms of uh, and supporting each other, and a lot of it is I think brought about through the social media, uh, through Facebook, and through the opportunity to to post recent works and friends supporting or post events and friends coming. But I do see that it's. Um, it's rarely negative, and it seems to always be positive, and a lot of, a lot of enthusiasm for each other's events or openings and attendance, and and that that feels nice and collaborative, <clears throat> and and uh, like everyone's in it together. Um, and I have seen also some development going uh, to help each other with uh, connections to Chicago, and I've seen people help each other with connections uh, with. Uh, uh, classes and and getting art center Traverse City Art Center going again and getting um, you know the cal cultural data project uh, going and art serve and all all these things that are starting to get some momentum and get going so it does feel like there is uh, a bit of enthusiasm going on and not a movement yet like you say but it seems like it's getting there a like is not a movement. Like, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> well, it could be. <laughs> mm. Not so much. Um, Chad, you, you made uh, an interesting point about um, how you know we, we many of us live here because of the natural beauty. Um, what is the relationship to of of northern Michigan artists to? the natural world, and how does that differ from, say, an artist from Chicago or New York or Los Angeles? You ask me. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I, you know, I think, for me, it was a conscious choice. You know, like I said, when I left northern Michigan, I, I, it was to escape, you know, and then after I'd been in that urban world for a while, I realized that my inspiration was here, you know, that uh, my subject matter, my artwork, uh, was, was what I knew. Okay, so that's the trees and the trout and the streams and, the, and that sort of thing. So I was, you know, living a lie when I was in Chicago. Um, more or less, you know, trying to fit into that environment. So, but coming back up here, you know, in the early 90s and, as, and being, you know, a young artist in the early 90s, it was really difficult. Uh, I think the movement has come, or the, the, the scene has matured considerably since then. And, um, and you know, for, for like meeting Glenn was like a big landmark. And and, uh, and and just branching out because I didn't even go into Traverse City or anything like that, you know. Um, so, you know, it was really meeting the other people who were working in this environment that brought me out of my shell and got me more involved in the local scene and being recruited by JRAC and Parkside and, you know, <laughs> so, so otherwise I'd be content to stay in the woods. Um, <laughs> And only venture out when I have to. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'd like to comment just a little bit on that, more from the standpoint of the cultural institutions and so on, and the and uh, uh, the environment of this area is obviously what we are known for: uh, the lakes and the water, and you know, or in the in the golf courses, or whatever. But uh, the challenge that I think we face, and, and certainly it's, it's a challenge that, that uh, I, a lot of the, the cultural institutions, such as the museum and the symphony and the playhouse and other organizations that I work with, in terms of how this area is marketed, we all recognize that there is this big art scene here. And it's a very rich one. And, uh, and, and, and whether it's individual artists or whether it's cultural offerings in, this, in the scale of, of organizations that do that. But uh, Northwest Michigan, uh, still, if you, if you were to ask people from around the state, you know, what's the leading important thing about Northwest Michigan, I'm not so sure that, that the arts would come to the top as quickly as the uh, environment 
in which we all treasure and we're all influenced by. But you know why people come here from other places to visit uh, has probably not as much to do with the art scene. I, hopefully they discover that once they're here, but it's not how this region, I think, gets marketed by those responsible for marketing the region. But I think it's also changing a little bit, right. too. I mean, I, mm -hmm. you say the word art, mm -hmm. my head goes the visual, mm -hmm. but you look at our foodie town mm -hmm. now. You know, there's a whole art in the, the food, there's um, the music, the theater, the um, film festival. I mean, those are things that are all kind of creating not to be redundant, a creative economy. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, we have this wonderful environment that's created this perfect spot to grow uh, a whole nother sense of you know economic development out of it to layer on top of it. Yeah, yeah I, would, I would agree. I think mm -hmm. the film festival has is you know um, probably done a lot to change that, but uh, it's it. Beyond the film festival, I know it's mm -hmm. you know it's it's just something. Those of us who are in the cultural institution mm -hmm. sector sector are always challenged by mm -hmm. uh, in terms of uh, how we get marketed by the uh, areas that are responsible for marketing Northwest Michigan mm -hmm. and that marketing uh, certainly food and wine and so on, uh, but. Uh, of course, I'd always like to see more from that cultural side. Mm -hmm. I agree. I think it's us trying to strive mm -hmm. right. mentally, at least right. on yeah. the panel, to go, no, yeah. we need to have this. Right. <laughs> and, and, and I think in, in other communities that don't have the richness of the environment that we do, uh, the arts move much more to the forefront. If you go look at the Lansing Convention and Visitors Bureau publications <coughs> about Lansing, <laughs> the arts have a much bigger prominence in their publications mm -hmm. than they will here because they don't have that other to market in the same way or offer. Let's, you know, if we, if we were to um, try to step up the marketing mm -hmm. of, of art as a region, mm -hmm. we'd either have to appeal to people because of the amount of art that we have and, and the volume that people know that they can access here, or we need to think of a way to, to brand the region as, as having something special in the product that uh, our artist workforce produces. And so that gets back to your other question is, is what is it about the rural area versus being in the city as an artist that, you know, what, what do you have that, that you don't have in, in more metro areas? And I, I guess it, to me, sometimes gets back to um, uh, the input that we have in our surroundings and in our brain, which affects you know the output, but it also uh, I think more artists being able to do plein air and get outside and paint what's in front of them versus from an image, I think does add a, a different quality to what is is derived and and just the fact that we're reflecting such a beautiful area that is unique, um, it, it is it is perhaps a brandable entity um you know for you know for marketing and advertising it, it's hard there, there's a, a woman in elk rapids uh leslie lee who maybe many of you mm -hmm. who has who did try to start something of the oh, there's a bug crawling across the table um, <laughs> how nature is uh, nature is alive. let's ask what the bug has to say <laughs> what do you have to say? Uh, speaking but, of that um, but she had the idea and tried to organize the idea of uh, branding our area as, lake, I think it was lake effect mm -hmm. art and having a color palette that reflected, you know, what would be the color palette of our area and can we kind of show that? And, and you know, it, it's hard because although we are an, an entity, we're artists are so much individuals mm -hmm. and it's hard to say that we're going to produce a product along a color palette. But it happens. It happens to happen <laughs> because of the inspiration around us. Uh, but it, it's um, it, it gets down to trying to I think make uh, gets down to our policies and our government and how we uh, incorporate art into the rules that we make and the the opportunities we create. And once we start opening those doors, um, then we start appearing like an art. Town and then artists start to move here more, and then people start. To, it has all that wrapped up into it. 
No, so it's interesting topic. Out just we can't afford it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> that always happens. But. When I first moved here, I was involved a little bit with the um, uh, Traverse City Arts Council, Traverse City Area Arts Council, and I remember somebody associated with that group kept saying, "We need to be the Santa Fe of the North." You need mm -hmm. to be the Santa Fe of the North. At the time, I kind of, again, scratched my head at that because it seemed like an unusual analogy. But actually listening to this conversation made me say, like, oh, <clears throat> that's, a, that's a smaller city that actually does a good job of promoting both its natural beauty and its cultural tourism. And it's mm -hmm. probably had this kind of more people, more artists move there because there's an art scene, because it's known for art. But I, I think our blessing is that we can't be branded, mm -hmm. right? You know, I mean, uh, we talked. You were on the. You went to those meetings too yeah, about yeah, defining mm -hmm. our palette, mm -hmm. and you know, God bless Taos. You, when you see that stuff, you know their palette. But we, don't, I, I just can't pin it down. And and you, you said you did the mixed media stuff across the street at Shorts. Mm -hmm. To me, the palette includes like rusted metal that you find. You know, a rusted yeah. van in the field and. It's not minerals and sand and so much as like, you know, beat up pieces of shingles that fall off a roof and stuff like that. That's part of my palette and mm -hmm. that's what I'm passionate about, but I can't make a color chart for it. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's kind of a, a curse for us, but at the same time, I think it keeps us from, you know, becoming, you know, where the moose is our icon or, or something like right. that, you know? Right. Well, um, and I, yeah, and just to, to, to continue on that, I mean, I was part of those meetings too, and I, you know, I've, I'm not an artist, and so that's not, you know, what that look is, is not my uh, role to determine, but I, I got the sense that artists really didn't appreciate the idea of going there that the, as you said, I mean, the, the, the nature of this region uh, is that uh, you can come here and you can draw from the environment if you want, but you don't have to, to be an artist uh, in, the, in the area. And, uh, and you, can, you can create that look and it sort of becomes defined, but, you know, I, I, if, 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 if you want to, if you want to be an artist who, who creates to a look as opposed to creating to your own look, if you will. You know, and and I, I, I don't know how that works for artists who, who live in the, in the Southwest. And if, if they're working to that palette and that look and so on, are they doing it in a commercial sense or are they really doing it in their own sense of creativity, where here I, artists probably draw from the environment, but they interpret it in their own way. I think you just described the never-ending argument in art, mm -hmm. to, to stay true to yourself or produce something that's going to sell. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, there's a, and I don't mean to offend anyone, but you know, we moved up here from Southeast Ohio, and I said, if I see one more lighthouse painting, mm -hmm. I'm going to scream. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, where's the diversity? Mm -hmm. um, you know, nine, ten years later, we're finding the diversity, but you know, what's in the galleries, what sell sells versus what I know we all love to make, is always a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and but interestingly enough, in the when we when we've done the jury the five year juried exhibition at the museum and we bring in a juror from another part of the state to look at it, and the first thing that usually happens is that they'll look through everything there, and the stuff that goes the quickest is the stuff that looks like somebody just copied what was around them as opposed to interpreting and mm -hmm. being creative in the statement. Uh, uh, and, and so uh, that idea of, you know, producing what, what will sell as opposed to, mm -hmm. but obviously you got to make a living. Well, it, and you're talking you know, jury so. versus right. gallery salesman, right. and I think it's a, right. a challenge. I think everyone, you know, as an artist has to ask mm -hmm. themselves, you know, mm -hmm. as a starting off artist, what is my goal? Am I here to make art um, to fulfill a need that I might have? Um, or am I here to produce commercial work? 
and I'm a graphic designer, I will openly say I produce commercial work. Um, but it's a question. We all juggle it. I mean, oh, yeah. I, a couple of weeks ago, I did a full page illustration for the New York Times on golf. And it's not my forte, but I did it because it was a great paying gig. And right. this week I'm painting. I'm doing my own right. stuff. So, But you it's interpreted it well, and it turned into a beautiful piece of art. I can't I wait to see that. <laughs> <laughs> I only saw it on Facebook, I think. So it's, it's cool. Thank what do you guys think? Facebook. <laughs> yeah, Facebook. I'm telling it's you, us like all connected in our holes. <laughs> <laughs> I think by being here, we all, we all have that kind of stigma. Stigma. I mean, in, I'm also a musician, and in the 90s, like when Chad moved up here, I, I remember playing at the Park Place and someone coming up from downstate and saying, gosh, you guys are, are really good. Are you um, local or are you professionals? <laughs> <laughs> yep. So we're all dealing with that, you know, that yoke around our necks. But. Mm -hmm. Questions out here? Comments? I gotta say that I've served on boards and I know most of the people in the uh, audience here are like educators and you know I, most of these people up here have just as much business being here I know. <laughs> out there so uh, we're sort of speaking to the choir but thank you all for coming. <laughs> I'm glad they outnumber us too. Yes, thank you. <laughs> we'll go and recruit some free beer shorts. Um, how many of you folks do this full time for a living to make, to make your actual living from from being an artist. Okay. If you count graphic design. Is it hard? I mean, you know, compared to like being like someplace in downstate or someplace elsewhere in the country where there is, this is a, a, a rural area to me is more difficult to be an artist and that's my own observation. I think you got to make it your own. Um, you have to go out and it, it's like the jobs don't land in your lap. You're often trying to network with everybody you possibly can. I have clients from, you know, northern Michigan to New York to um, New Mexico um, that I just, it's all about who I meet, oh, here's my card. I mean, that's, as a graphic designer, that's my challenge because you do everyone in town's website and brochures and they're good for the next 15 years. <laughs> I think it's no, hard everywhere. They're not going to be if they stay in business. If they stay in yeah, business. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, I was just one of my best friends lives on Bleecker Street in New York City, and he just finished writing a beautiful biography of Roy Orbison. He's got a really hip uh, band called Tribekistan, and he it's catch as catch can. You know, he's like teaching, he's playing gigs, he's writing. Um, I think it's hard for everybody everywhere that's if you call yourself an artist. There's, there's no easy pass, I don't think. What is it, the 1% of the 10% of the 10% yeah. that mm -hmm. actually make it and survive off of what they're doing? Yeah. yeah, I mean, it's definitely harder up here. There are fewer opportunities. Um, but look at you, you're getting flown to England to get awards and... Right, well, you know, that's the 1% of them. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know I look, I, I'm lucky. You know, I, you're I, good. I well, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I'm lucky, and I, and I think, you know, whatever, you know, that I, I'm, I'm, that I, you know, been given these opportunities. So, um, but you know, on the same note, you know, it, you know, for 20 years I haven't been, you know, this like, you know, you know, powerhouse artist guy. You know, for you know, quite a few years I was cranking out god awful crappy wedding invitations and that kind of. <laughs> nasty stuff that I didn't want to do, you know, but, uh, you know, you, you got to pay the bills, you got to feed the kids and all that other stuff. And it really hasn't been until the last, you know, six, seven years that, you know, that I've been able to focus purely on what I want to do and been able to be selective about, you know, the projects that I take on and the people that I work with. Do you find, and, and I would assume to some extent that the internet and the ability to communicate and connect outside of the region and to market your talents and your abilities and so on to that broader audience out there should, should start to break down to some extent the difference between living in northern Michigan and living in a 
big city. I mean, we know mm -hmm. in the other professions that people, there are a lot of people who live here that, you know, they're doing their work in the world, but this is where they live. And it, and it would seem to me that for artists of competence, uh, certainly sitting here, that, you know, the ability to, to get work is not limited in the way that it might have been before because of your ability to be more visible anywhere in the world. Right. But I think you, I mean, I totally agree that you have to put on another hat, though. Right. Uh, you know, as an artist who might be in a loft in New York, not that I've ever been to New York, so I don't know all that, but, but you know, being discovered is one thing of going to a bar or seeing mm -hmm. someone come to the loft or see your studio, but up here you have to have that business hat on, too. You have mm -hmm. to be <laughs> actively <laughs> involved with, you know, posting things on Facebook, getting yourself on different. Um, art websites, you know, Deviant or anything like that, and just being aware of that whole business side of marketing yourself mm -hmm. versus just the accidental, hey, cool right. work, you know, well, it's... Yeah. I think, you know, every successful artist mm -hmm. probably has that capacity or they have someone who That's has that capacity yeah. for them, usually called a gallery, mm -hmm. you know, that yeah. can that can do that. And yeah, galleries. Huh? Not galleries. Not galleries, well. <laughs> Not up here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry to the gallery yeah, I like how you lose my name when you say that. <laughs> There are exceptions. There are really good galleries up here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Well, but, uh, of course. I mean, you know, in the, uh, in the, you know, it's the same way with agents for musicians. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the musicians who, who can yeah. make it on their own and probably more so in the, in the world today mm -hmm. because of being able to put their music out online and, and find it, but still in all, in my world, uh, you know, I'm getting calls all the time, all the time, and emails all the time from agents trying to sell me on whatever performing group uh, might, they might be uh, uh, promoting. Uh, you know, so it's, you know, I think it's that balance of uh, how you how you deal with the business side of the world. Yeah. I think that definitely does help having, you know, access to, through media to other mm -hmm. markets, mm -hmm. but it is sometimes an energy drain, I think, for some artists to try to be on top of it, so to mm -hmm. speak. Um, mm -hmm. But once some markets open up, it really, it really, you know, clicks. But at the same time, another, I think, opportunity for artists if we're talking about just visual artists at the moment, um, is that uh, our printing technology and uh, digital imaging has expanded um, our opportunities to sell images so much greater in the applications in terms of um, uh, interior design and, and uh, commercial space application. I mean, you could put your painting or photography on a wall, a floor, a ceiling, I mean, not that you want want to with everything, but there is opportunity for those that want to say, I've developed these great images and I can sell the original, but I can also do so much with this image that I've created now. You can even yourself make your own wallpaper, your own fabric, your own everything off of your image very economically. There in fact is now, I'm sure many of you have heard of it, and it's hard for artists to separate what media that they're talking about and where their creative thought process starts. So artists, in terms of how they're making money, it's not just about the painting or the illustration or the photography. Sometimes it's also about you know, how they perceive the world and how they're creating ideas. Um, but there's now an affordable home 3D printer, which means that ideas can go from uh, the originator's head to a model um, if you're willing to invest a $1,500 machine. And, and it's, that's pretty, that's going to speed up where art and creativity can go and how it can make money, I, th I, I think. Uh, and ha but having someone introduce us all to those technologies is going to be important, I think, to, to be able to plus out whatever we do. Let me ask you guys, um, you know, I come from kind of the background of working with old craftsmen, you know, the, there's the art of having that craft of creating a, a book or throwing a pot. Do you think the technology is kind of, you know, no matter how much they'll yell at you for it, but the technology kind of working in is a form of craft? I mean, you have to uh -huh. have that knowledge. Right. 
um, to finally do it. It's another medium in a yeah. way, right? It could um, whether be. it be accepted or not by the old uh -huh. school, but. But I, you know, Chad sells a book because someone has a physical experience. They mm -hmm. hold one of those books, they open it up, and for me, my mouth waters. You oh, know, yeah. I, right. you yeah. can get the same text for a dime down in the corner, used right. bookstore, you know. Right. But the, the idea of the craftsman mm -hmm. and that unique work that you do, you know, how many people are, are, are doing that? It's probably is not as many as there used to be because you're keeping alive something that has gone by the wayside in the commercial world. Right. And so you're doing it in a special way, but the ability to market the uniqueness of what you do to people who are connoisseurs and want that right. is, is, is you can find them. Yeah. And they yeah. can find you. Well, tying that into the earlier question about you know, how has the internet you know, facilitated mm -hmm. this, I wouldn't be able to do what I do up here without the internet. My mm -hmm. website is my tool, and yet I still have to go out and visit the special collection librarians. I just uh, flew back uh, and just got back today after being out, uh, out east for a week to a conference and uh, show a symposium of, of fine press printers from around the world. And uh, where, you know, so every couple of years we get to see each other and see the physical products. And this, you know, if it weren't for that, you know, of people that are actually getting the hands-on experience because, thank God, the buyers and the uh, special collection librarians and all come as well, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, you know, but actually having, you know, the internet is a huge help, but also that, that, uh, that the tactile experience. And then that, you know, that hands-on experience separates out the, uh, you know, the true craftsmen and the people who, you know, just like the people who can draw versus the people who say, oh, my kid can do that. Well, you know, <laughs> you know, you know, the people who can draw versus the people who, you know, uh, you know, so I think craft is is exceedingly important. I think that you need to be able to know how to do it the proper way before you can make a departure, and that it scares me that um, that the uh, that on a national level, especially in the United States, that that departure away from craft into purely conceptual um, ideas is, is is continues to gain ground rather than. You know, more universities are teaching toward the idea of concept versus actual skills, you know. And is painting, printmaking, sculpture, um, are those things going to be around in 20 years? Who knows? Because we now we have all these new tools. We have video, we have computer animation, we have... Uh, the engraving know. filter. Yeah, the engraving. We have maker machines, maker bots, you know, it's like you don't have to be a sculpture anymore, you, all you have to do is be able to, you know, competently program X, Y, and Z. I'm going to get but the I small press out. Yeah, you know. I mean, there is a, there is a craft to... Uh, to programming it? Sure. I'll concede I, that, I mean, but uh, that's not what this is I don't, I don't think about. it'll ever go away. It I don't, won't I don't go away, it, but yeah. it's, it's being diluted. Yeah. But and you'll still get those people that are putting their heads next to a box with a cover over it, taking the big um, photographs. The pinhole so people camera. will go yeah. back in yeah. time and then reclaim these things. Right. So you're not going to be mm -hmm. lost. Yeah. yeah, letterpress has been declared dead for you know, <laughs> a century <laughs> now. That's the best reason to buck the system and go and exactly. investigate and recreate That's why it. I went into it. You know. <laughs> I figured there'd be less competition. I might be good at it. <laughs> you know, that, that same kind of, uh, um, you know, treasuring what we have and holding on to it. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple artists I asked about, you know, input for today, and one of them said, you know, one of the reasons that she does plein air pastel, her name is Louise Pond, is because she she's she wants to capture things that she's not sure will exist in another 10 years. Um, and in fact, just she just went back to, to paint a barn that, to check the lighting on a barn she painted a couple of years ago and do it again, and the barn was gone, and she said, Oh my gosh! I have this painting now of a of a barn on our landscape that doesn't exist anymore, and and that's the sad part that 
and I think maybe a lot of us feel is, is like that preservation aspect of, mm -hmm. of, of what we have and holding on to, to some simple values and some of the things we have. What, um, <clears throat> this is a, a bit of a departure, but your story made me think of it. Um, what's the role of rural artists in um, environmental stewardship and environmental advocacy? Or is there one? <laughs> I, I, you know, I, several times a year I work with kids in schools and do collaborative community artworks. Just happen to have one. This week's, uh, why don't I, can I hand it? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah. I mean, this is, um, was a like a three by six foot door, and it's it it was a project with Wings of Wonder, the Raptor Rehabilitation Center in in uh, Leelanau County, and it's just it's great to go into schools and have the kids studying a science unit and a poetry unit and an art unit all at the same time, and it's all about stewardship. You know, it doesn't matter if they're like adopting a wetland next to their school or you know, learning about raptors in their watershed or whatever, but the, the art is like the thing that sort of pulls it all together. And, and this is like a big collage. It's made up of about, I don't know, three or 400 little sketches that the kids did, and then we collaged them onto a big door. Um, the writing is stuff from their scientific journals. And my job was just to kind of pull it all together and, and, and let them art direct me and my contribution to it, but it just, it's all about stewardship. So I don't know if I'm a rural artist, but it, it was, you know, this was at Platte River Elementary. I've done, a, I've got a piece here in Bel Air and uh, Kalkaska and, you know, it's, it's just so much fun. And, and the kids are sophisticated. I mean, they're, they're, they're we're building websites and they're communicating via email and, um, you know, they're telling me what they're reading and stuff. So I'm, I'm like, Know, really <laughs> encouraged by that. Yeah. So. Plus, you've been very active, like with the uh, Grand Traverse Watershed Center, and yeah. you know, and like all these other environmental um, advocates, you know, like uh, Friends of the Jordan and uh, Tip of the Mitt, and like all these, you know, all these organizations, um, you know, generally tap the local artists. You know, they want us to participate in some level and uh, whether it be donating a piece to fundraise or which happens all the time you know, <laughs> and, uh, or uh, not that there's anything wrong no no that's fine <laughs> we can always say no uh, or yeah um, you know but I think you know as far as you know what, how we can participate in environmental awareness um, is uh, you know mostly on that level. You know, we 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 get involved, and in, and then maybe more so, but maybe not in an artistic way. And as far as the education thing, yeah, like Glenn goes into the schools directly. I do some. I'm, I'm sure others do. I know Rachel. You know, runs the kids program here pretty much, and. Uh, you know, so that's, you know, all those things, outreach, because there won't be any art in the future unless we, you know, are, are bringing in that next generation of, of, of kids uh, to, to show them what's possible up here, because, you know, not, all, not everybody, you know, can, you know, aside from the internet, you know, access uh, art. You know, unless somebody comes directly in, you know, I mean, these kids in Mansalona, you know, there's kids in Mansalona that have never been to Traverse City, you know, they don't know what a city is, you know. So if they see real art, then, you know, it just sort of starts their brain ticking. I know it happened to me in Cadillac way back when, you know, it's like, oh, uh, that's, that's, people do that? You know, so it takes that spark. And, you know, and if we can provide that, you know, even if we're not aware that we're doing it, you know, that's... Uh, I'd almost even take the word environment, I mean, not that it's not important, but, um, you know, as artists, and especially if we enjoy <coughs> educating, just being good stewards for everything that we, 
you know, passing on the arts, passing on, you know, the respect for the environment, respect for each other, mm -hmm. just being able to educate or even mentor each other, you know, that's, I, I think, a way of saying it, you know, that we can be stewards. I think uh, when um, when you love something, you want to protect it. And uh, if if uh, if the artist you know is interested in the subject of the outdoors, they're going to want to protect it, and it ends up being part of what they do. But it also, speaking of kids, if if we can ha use art to help them interact with the environment and fall in love with the environment and want to. <coughs> To protect it, it, it's it's a it's just a wonderful way to act as a conduit for all kinds of teaching and and um, involvement. Yeah, I can. I, I had a a nice class uh, about a year and a half ago. Uh, Babs went to a couple of them to help out with with uh, with kids. I tried to figure out. Um, it was a, through Art Rapids grant, but I tried to figure out a way to to engage kids after they'd been in school all day. And uh, there's some of the kids necess wouldn't have a whole lot of uh, energy to sit in another classroom. And so I developed a curriculum off of Andrew Goldsworthy type, you know, outdoor sculptures with, with uh, environmental materials. And uh, it worked out quite well. They had a lot of fun. And um, along the way, we had opportunities to speak about, you know, uh, preservation and, you know, environment and and where they could go with it. And then it kind of interwove just so much. They got to experience photography and videography and um, had, we had planning, we had logistics, we had to figure out how to get a ton of cherry pits over to the Library Hill. <laughs> 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 I mean, they didn't use, uh, Andrew Goldsworthy really might have used what he found, but we thought, okay, we got cherry orchards, we got a ton of pits, you know, how can we use those? We just did different things and it, it helped them be involved in the community in a way too, because they had to talk to town uh, the Department of Public Works to do one thing, they had to talk to farmers to do another, and they they had a lot of different benefits from that project. Why don't you do another one of those? Uh, yeah, well, you know, I know, I've been thinking about that. Well, that would be good. Yeah, and I, I think it would good. be. It went very well. Well, thanks. Uh, I will I will think about that. It, it might be, be great. I did it in the springtime uh, about a year and a half ago. but. Um, be interesting to see what would happen if we did a winter one, sure. wouldn't it? Yeah. And I think the art councils have, um, you know, deserve a lot of praise as well. Mm -hmm. Because I remember when I was at when, at JRAC when we had that, you know, those were like state level grants, uh, yeah. right? That would allow us to take you know real artwork into schools because you know schools can't take field trips anymore. So the local art councils are really the liaison between you know the working artists and and uh, you know the, the kids. Yeah. And, and Amanda, that would be a question. I you know what are what are your thoughts about the local arts councils? Mm -hmm. There we're getting more and more of them. Mm -hmm. um, are, are they you know are they working for you? Uh, are there too many? Are there not enough? Um, I have a conflict of interest on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I mean, you know, it's a good. I, I would love to know the answer too, because it's you know, if we're serving our purpose and we're not duplicating services, I guess we're doing good. Um, and we had that big collaborative there for a while, which kind of died but, very quickly. Very I don't quickly. know what why it died, but it did. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I was responsible for that. I was responsible for the email for list, the and then I had a baby. <laughs> yeah. That'll do it. There you go. It's all about you, isn't it? <laughs> Traverse City's kind of retooling. You know, they're, yeah. they mm -hmm. they've they don't exist anymore either. Mm -hmm. They're copying us, um, but they're <laughs> kind of virtual and, and and trying to, I think, come up with a new role. Yeah. Is there an arts council now in Traverse City, or is it? No. Indeed. Oh, what? Arts council. Oh. No. The Arts Council in Traverse City was so dependent on state funding from Michigan mm -hmm. Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs or MCA's Michigan Council for Arts. Uh, uh, and when it died, or when Engler cut it off and then it came back, uh, the Arts Council uh, didn't have the resources because it was so dependent on state grants to operate. 
one of the things that, uh, and I don't know where this will go uh, uh, in the future, but as I, I mentioned earlier that uh, the four, uh, the symphony, the playhouse, the uh, opera house, and the museum uh, started treat ticketing a number of years ago now, and we formed, to do that, we formed a nonprofit entity between the four organizations and the executive directors of each is the board of that, if you will. And when we transitioned to the ticketing operation uh, to uh, uh, up north uh, media, uh, Travis the Magazine and, and that group, uh, we have maintained the nonprofit uh, organization. Uh, so we now have, at least between the four major organizations, not that there aren't others, but that collaborative that we formed to, to create the first uh, uh, component, uh, we're maintaining the nonprofit entity as a vehicle for us to continue to collaborate together and to uh, potentially uh, generate revenues or apply for grants and funding to do other collaborative projects. So if over time that might evolve back into an arts council, if you will, uh, I don't know. But uh, we have uh, at least maintained a nonprofit entity that we can use for future collaborative projects uh, and as a vehicle to generate revenues and to get grants and support to, uh, to do larger collaborative projects among ourselves. And of course, TREAT serviced a wide range of, of small nonprofits uh, with, uh, in this case, with ticketing opportunities. <coughs>
it also provides, I guess, uh, you know, some kind of, um, it, you know, collective enthusiasm for arts in a community, which is great, yeah. too. Well, but well, I would. Uh, sorry. Mm -hmm. um, like the Strawboy Circle of Arts, what I've observed over the four years, that it has established a more of a community mm -hmm. that didn't exist before. Um, is it necessarily doing ex exactly what the founding members, you know, started out to? Not right. necessarily. Um, but I think it's, it's forming a community around the arts, which is really important. And the, the fact that, um, you know, you look around, every small community has a um, Carnegie library or a sports team, whatever. I don't see why we should respect the arts any less than that. I think every community deserves that. And Yes, I think we can do a better job collaborating, these individuals collaborating, but it's a lot easier for one organization in Charlotte to collaborate with one organization in East Jordan or Point City than to have 50 artists in Charlevoix trying to collaborate with each other. It's like herding cats. <laughs> <laughs> That's my art. Organizing artists is like herding cats. Mm -hmm. They all just go this way. <laughs> so for a follow-up question to that, how, how can arts councils and arts organizations better serve the arts and artists in Northern Michigan? Well, you know, I'll take that because uh, I'm surprised I haven't heard more about uh, uh, what we might be doing, and and uh, you know, as 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 the museum, and, and as I see our role within the region, uh, we certainly uh, uh, have artists that uh, we have uh, that we sell their work through our museum store and so on. Our store manager Terry Tarno makes those arrangements, and we do holiday sales, and we do a jury show from time to time. We don't do a lot of that. And, and, we, uh, and we do exhibitions uh, uh, with invited artists from the region uh, from time to time, but we really don't do those exhibitions because those artists are necessarily regional artists. They are artists who live here, but their competency would justify them having an exhibition anywhere in any comparable museum in the state of Michigan or in the United States. Uh, that's sort of the way that I approach it. The reason Glenn had an exhibition at the museum was not because he's a regional artist. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and, and so, uh, you know, we, I see our role as, as different in, in that regard. Uh, I also see our role as, as being uh, a vehicle to sort of, uh, to more broadly enrich the, the community by bringing in talent from literally now around the world uh, and, and to create opportunities for artists or individuals in our region to encounter uh, new approaches, new ideas, or ways uh, that artists and performers in, across the world are, are, are doing what they do. And, you know, so if you come to the museum right now, I mean, we're, we have a Marshall Fredericks exhibition showcasing, you know, one of the great Michigan sculptors of the 20th century. Uh, and in the next gallery, uh, Miao Zhao Shun from Beijing uh, with digital video art in this case. Uh, he also does photography, but the shipping cost of a CD uh, for a computer and, and, and big panels are, are quite different and makes it much more accessible. Uh, so, you know, I look at our role as, as being that one of enrichment and, and providing opportunity not only for artists, but uh, for everybody uh, in the region to uh, uh, to have that that broader experience and engagement, uh, and 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 I said it, uh, and you know, and I uh, no hesitancy saying it here that I see our role as as 
is doing that more than sort of uh, showcasing everything that's going on in the region that's being showcased someplace else. Uh, um, we charge admission. You know, so an artist is, has an exhibition in a gallery somewhere in the region that you can go see for free for me to, to, to put a, a, an admission charge on that same opportunity uh, it doesn't quite make sense uh, to me. Uh, and we're the, you know, one of the few institutions, or in some cases the only institution in, in Northwest Michigan that can do the kinds of things that we do. Uh, and can bring, you know, into this region uh, uh, the opportunities that we've been able to do over the years. Um, so, uh, you know, that's been my philosophy uh, as director of the museum. Uh, and, and, and the same is, is true to some extent on, on the performing side. I mean, we just had, uh, when we opened the exhibition the other weekend, I mean, we had a performing group from Beijing uh, here and you know and and again bringing opportunities to uh, to uh, for people to hear music and see talent from far flung places uh, as well as uh, you know from uh, the United States and and from the region uh, so uh, you know, that's where we go with what we do. Uh, and, and, and we make as much of that available, you know, schools are having, you know, the school field trip challenge that they face right now, but we raise money to, to provide scholarships for schools uh, to be able to come to the museum. Uh, we have the Chinese acrobats this uh, Friday. We have 800 kids coming from Northwest Michigan for that experience. And it was sold before we announced it actively to teachers, just by rumor. And it's done that two years in a row. Wow. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and we'll have performing groups from Colombia and Ireland and, you know, and all over and, and uh, in, in Japan this year that, that will make available uh, for students to come. Uh, and experience, and we provide some scholarship funds and support for busing and so on, so that they can come and have those experiences. Uh, you mentioned earlier Mancelona. Years ago, now we we uh, had uh, a performance for schools, and the group from Mancelona came in, and the teacher said afterwards that was the first time that she thought her class had ever heard live music. You know in a performance wow. environment. Yeah. And I was stunned yeah. when and I heard that. There's a, and there's yeah. a lot more communities like Massalona yeah. out here, yeah. you know, uh, that uh, sadly. So. And I think it's important, exactly what you said, that you know, your role and then us as an arts council working hand in hand, mm -hmm. that we can show the kids the world, mm -hmm. bring them home, and show them that they can do it too. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. bingo. Mm -hmm. that, that, that it's not this, this like, Hollywood dream that they mm -hmm. they can get their hands dirty and they can uh, be that person in a museum maybe in China. Yeah. Don't show them Basquiat. <laughs> <laughs> I can go to Soho. Well, and I, I I'd like to also you know uh, you know I I, I communicate you know and, and I and I have been working with artists in China and and I, I hope to have uh, a visiting artist uh, Miao Zhaoshun is coming to Traverse City in November. Uh, we'll spend four days here and, and then uh, go on. But, but, you know, the Internet has made that opportunity for us as a museum. You know, I, I went to China, uh, saw Li Lan Li's work, the South Korean artist who we brought here, uh, and literally, you know, saw the work, read the label, took down the information, went on Google, found him in South Korea, sent him an email, and two months later, you know, his work is in Traverse City. Uh, and the same was true with Miao Zhaoshun, uh, you know, that, that we'll be bringing. So our opportunity as an institution to connect and interact with artists around the world is now is as easy as it was, you know, it, in some ways easier than, 
than it used to be my having to drive to Detroit or, or you know, go somewhere to meet with an artist. And, and what I wanted to, to ask is, uh, uh, working artists in this region, what, how much communication do you have with artists in other parts of the United States, or are you starting to engage with a dialogue with artists in other parts of the world? I mean, that, the internet has opened that up, but to, to what extent have you had those opportunities or taken the opportunities to, to sort of uh, communicate with artists who are in sort of the same environment or same situation you are in another uh, uh, place? It's pretty much exclusively my, my situation um, is communicating with other people that do what I do, the fine books from around the country and around the world. Mm -hmm. There's one other person in Michigan. I don't show in Michigan. Mm -hmm. You know, it's uh, you know, it's, it's a so so the internet and you know that ease of communication and the the, the cheapness of it. I mean, the mm -hmm. inexpense of it as you know it is is very important to what I do. Um, and, and it's a daily thing, all times during the day, email, you know, I'm having dialogue with, with my colleagues from everywhere, you know, so it, it's very important. Probably couldn't be here doing this, you know, 20 years ago. I started the website as soon as there was an internet, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, if it wasn't for that, you know, it's, it's very important in my case. And I think most other artists, too. I was going to say, I think that's also a challenge, too, for our emerging artists who still have to work full-time, yeah. create, mm -hmm. and then still have to tackle this technology in order to find other um, working artists or outlets or anything like that. So mm -hmm. Back to that hindrance versus the... Right. Mm -hmm. Well, but, but, you know, like, you, you work in a specialized area. Right. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, the artists who work in plein air here and are there, are yeah. there organized uh, groups of artists in other parts of the country that, you know, you... There's one that I, I, I keep <coughs> a little bit up on. It's called mm -hmm. Artists to Studio. Artists mm -hmm. that work in the studio, it's connected. It's an online community that's, um, you know, world, it's worldwide mm -hmm. but mostly mm -hmm. United States. And, um, and then LinkedIn has some really uh, mm -hmm. <coughs> good conversation groups mm -hmm. with artists and uh, diff there's probably three of them that I, I think are, there's an art collector group and there is um, there is uh, an artist group and there's also just um, a, a creative industries group that I've been part of. And every once in a while I'll find an interesting topic to chime in on and chat back and forth mm -hmm. with people or I'll put a topic out there that I think is, you know, interesting to find out what people think about, but it comes and goes because of that overwhelming time consumption that, that yeah. involves, you know, to mm -hmm. keep up with people. Uh, and there are a couple people from uh, in Facebook that have asked a friend me <clears throat> that are from other countries that that are artists that um, I don't really I don't really know how, where they came from. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> and uh, every once in a while they'll post a comment on something and I'll post something back. But it is. It is something to the fact that you know you can translate anything now uh, on the computer quite easily. Mm -hmm. I was communicating with with um, you know a, a guy in um, oh gosh where was he? He was in Guatemala. Yeah, I, I don't know Spanish, but he's an artist in the rural part of Guatemala. I don't even know how in the world we. He's probably connected through one of the LinkedIn groups, but because mm -hmm. sometimes on LinkedIn you can pull off somebody's Facebook, um, but. You know, we're trans I'm translating back and forth and speaking with somebody that I would not have been able to do a year ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, that translation yeah. is correct. Right. Yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. Yeah. 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 Has he talked to you lately? Or is that it? Yeah. 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 He might propose to you, you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> I probably have, like, I'm going to have, like, three paintings come in the mail tomorrow <laughs> 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 with a pay on delivery. <laughs> But there's also, uh, you know, discussion lists like, you know, mm -hmm. before LinkedIn and Facebook, there, uh, 
you know, or like, you know, I, I be, I'm on like several, you know, letterpress discussion lists, the book arts discussion list, you know, there's your printers, binders, you know, and all different aspects of, of the trade that I'm involved in. That have been going on for over a decade, you know, where these are very simple. There's no images, there's no attachments, but it's a way to, to ask questions and gain technical knowledge, you know, to, it's like, oh, this ink isn't working, what do I do, you know, you know. So, you know, I think, you know, that, that ease of communication with anybody in the world, you know, is, is very important and has changed the way we live. Uh, you know, one of the lectures that I attended was uh, George Macy's limited edition club, you know, and how did this guy in 1920, you know, coordinate, you know, great printers and great artists from sometimes transatlantically while there were wars going on and still produce a great book every month, you know, and it's like the technical, you know, the things that we have to surpass today are nothing compared to that, you know. So, you know, the tools that we have available are, are amazing. I think we're still trying to keep up with a lot of that catch up with, with the whole concept. And other people have utilized them tremendously and to their advantage and other people, you know, that, uh, you know, that the older generation, forgive me, you know, are still struggling to, you know, figure out how to turn on their iPad, you know, and, and uh, I'm talking about you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you amazed know. that something happens on LinkedIn. That I just learned something today. Yeah. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> you know. I'm one of those older generation. I, I'm on LinkedIn, but I never pay any attention mm -hmm. to it. People ask to you to, to be connected to me, and I, okay, but, you know, <laughs> don't bother me. But 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 Glenn, you use uh, uh, the internet a lot. I mean, do you use it to to sell you to sell your work? Yeah. And so on? I mean, do you find that successful or uh, or a way to? It, right now, today, mm -hmm. I I feel like the more stuff I post on Facebook, the less I sell. I get tons of likes, and I'm sure people grab images, which I don't. That's that's fine. Mm -hmm. But I think there's there's this kind of knee jerk reaction in me that wants to tell people, you know, this is fine, but just go away and go go to a gallery, go to a mm -hmm. club and hear a band live, go hear somebody mm -hmm. talk about writing, mm -hmm. um, and and that's and there there's there's tons of that stuff going on, so I, I feel mm -hmm. good about that. Um, the main thing I use it for is I it. When I'm checking these other communities around the country um, or, or other colleagues, it, it kicks my butt. I see stuff that they're doing, mm -hmm. and I, I get it keeps me from being complacent. I'm going, wow, that's that's mm -hmm. cool. I gotta step it up here. So it 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 keeps me I don't know, mm -hmm. real. <laughs> I think there's a challenge to selling art online, mm -hmm. um, unless you're doing digital prints or giclées or anything like that. Um, you know, my husband's work is very tactile, very three-dimensional, and um, he does not represent well on a website because everything gets so flattened. Um, and I can say we sold one piece in 15 years of having a website. Um, I don't know, I think that's a challenge. I mean, I don't know how you, well you sell off your website or if it's more like a portfolio, which it's, is how we use It's both, and, and a lot of times, I, I, I do a lot of commissions, and what I'll do is I'll build uh, a walkthrough website for the commission so the person can follow it sketch to finish, oh, cool. you know, and I'll, I'll do a comp and I'll drop it into mm. a photograph that I've taken of their living room and um, that kind of stuff is really mm. handy. Yeah. And that's a participation. The blog and the, the, the website yeah, type right. of thing, yeah. Mm -hmm. how, the, how do blogs work for you guys? I know that John Unger told me one time that he said he had, he's had a website forever and he didn't sell diddly on it. Right. When he started blogging. That's when things took off. Just yeah. He's a techie. He knows yeah. how to like, yeah. get all yeah. his yeah. keywords. Yeah. Well, web, yeah. Websites are static. Blogs are, right. you know, right. are like journals, you know, right. so, you, you know, yeah. Is that something that, you know, you'd have time to do or that you do, you know, during the course of, you know, all the other things you're trying to do, you know, your website and once a week. produce work and all yeah. that? Just make an effort once a week because people follow, you know, a project that, you know, it might take a couple of years to do a book. So, you know, they, you know, the collectors, they want to see what's going on in anticipation of the latest project, you okay. know. So I just only started the blog last spring. But, you know, that was very important. You know, people were excited about the Volker book. And, they, you know, like, you know, you could see the progress and, you know, you, like, try to create a dialogue with people, 
but otherwise you're just in your head, you know. And exactly. so I found the blog a very useful tool. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a, a like you said another another time. One more thing. Another you time know, sucking like vortex. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Down to 10 but you don't have to do it every day, you no. know. Questions from out there? Sorry about that. No, no. Yeah, no, that's good. It's kind of dominating the question area, so I want to make sure we get more questions answered. Jean uh, uh, brought up something about having these visiting Chinese artists that made me think about how important some of the Chinese artists have been in that country as far as. Um, political awareness and things like that. And I, I see the problems that we're having in this community as far as you know unemployment and seasonal labor. How does the artist fit into that? I mean, as being kind of like a political a social a agent for change. That, that's what I'm kind of curious about. This point, if anyone wants to comment to that. See, my mind didn't go to you know social or like political wise. I went educating the children. Um, and that's because I have that education side on me, but um, I've done a lot of research on terms of the arts and how it impacts um, a community through economic development, you know, cultural tourism, but also how if a child has that arts education, how their um, skill set or their abilities as they grow older um, changes versus children that haven't been exposed, you know, they have better problem solving skills, um, they can critically think, they can think independently, um, and I think that will help, you know, kind of move our community into a healthier state. Um, you know, politically, I've learned to stop but shut up sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I get in trouble a lot. Um, yeah, I don't know, as an artist, I pick my battles, and I've chosen to go with the kids as a way to change things. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, our art and music are um, are definitely, you know, emotional, powerful triggers for for many messages. I think music could probably move our whole world. You know, uh, Bono is a good example of how he's done that. Uh, but on the art end. If an artist is, is if an artist is politically charged and excited about a topic, that then I then I think that they will get involved with uh, helping to represent that political agenda, you know, with their art. But it it's hard to uh, pose that as a responsibility uh, unless somebody really has that in their heart that they want to support something. Um, but but often artists are hired to help enhance messaging of any kind, and. Um, and, and it, it is effective. It definitely captures us, us in a different way than, than um, you know, without it. it it's uh, definitely a, a role that, that artists play in, in many ways is to be the, the cross-pollinator on all kinds of different roles. <laughs> well, I think see. we're so, I mean, we're visual. Yeah. You know, it's a, our, our world, and this is not meant to take off on a whole other subject, but, you know, we're, we live in a visual world. The media around us, television, you know, audio and video. Um, and as artists, we have a, we can tell a story. Um, we can express so much more, and it's accepted or understood without a language barrier. I will say that my, my mother, who is an artist in Elk Rapids, uh, there have been some political issues in Elk Rapids this year, um, and uh, on, a, on a much more minor scale than anything in China. <laughs> but um, my mom decided to start a little comic strip in the local paper, and often she's also called upon to be the cover of the local paper in her, her watercolor work. But her little... Uh, cartoons that she was making were really political. I mean, they, but but they're really just her way of contributing to a community in the way that she knew how. You know that that's how she could, and it's, it was really interesting how she could tackle an issue with a drawing and one little blurb that would have gotten all kinds of flack if anybody were to write an article with the same message and. and and she was Joni, and she's this adored artist in town, so nobody's going to 
mind if she tells everybody to reverse the reverse parking and to, you know, let shorts have their brewery in town where they want. I mean, she was able to stand up to people with her little cartoons. I thought that was great that she could do something that people couldn't with just the written word in that way. Yeah, I, I, I want to, just because we had artists from China, they're, just, they're not all political no, artists. No, I, I just wanted to clarify that. That's, I, yeah. I, I threw political, yeah. but I meant yeah. as a change agent. Yeah. I mean, we, we have tough, you know, we have, we have real tough decisions to make. And mm -hmm. I think what, where the arts comes in, and it, for, I'm using a little story, mm -hmm. I never listened to music, I didn't participate in music until about two years ago, when I picked up an instrument and started playing for the first time. That led to me writing that I hadn't done. It, it t unlocked a portion of my brain that had previously been locked. And I think getting kids exposed to the arts and music is one thing that does that. And some people might like art price, some people might hate it, but what it's done in, in, in Grand Rapids is having this art prize, it's really gotten people to think about the community in a different way and the visual space because a lot of those are site-specific sculptures and people are looking at their community in a totally different way. And I guess that's why I'm thinking about um, infusing this more in rural areas in, in northern Michigan and in schools and I think you know, what JRAC is, is doing is really important because they they bring one thing that JRAC does is they bring really quality instructors. Um, it's not just like let's do some finger painting. It's not just doing finger painting. You know, it's it's teaching kids um, skills as well and a little bit of background about what they're learning. I mean, so I'm sorry I didn't want to confuse that you bring no. a political artist no. and I shouldn't use no. the term political because I didn't right. mean to. It's like a change yeah. agent. Yeah. Okay. I, I, the the interesting thing just to say just a few words about, uh, you know, what I, I, I've made like seven trips to China now, and to see uh, artists sort of uh, make that transition from a very conformist kind of society and in the art, which was, you know, it was done a certain way and it was done in a process with, uh, you know, the beautiful porcelains and all of the things that you see, so much of it uh, uh, in in team uh, efforts and so on, and you know, and I have a good friend who's a ceramic artist whose work we showed at the museum, uh, who uh, who goes to Jean de Jean, uh, and still has people. He'll design the piece and and, and then have people create molds and, and so on for what he does, but breaking out of the traditional images and you know being influenced much more broadly by world experiences and his life experiences and so on and which is changing the imagery uh, in the art and uh, some of it some of it good and some of it you know is just like any place you can find a lot of schlock <laughs> you know and when you go through the the art districts and, and so on uh, but it, it's really interesting to see that that individuality start to come out among artists in a society that has been very conformist uh, in, 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 a, in a way. And it's, and it's not so much about the idea of communism or anything like that. It's just always been a, a much more conformist society uh, uh, than, uh, than here the individual is celebrated and there that tradition was celebrated. Mm -hmm. And now that is, you see that breaking away and uh, artists being much more individual in their expression and some of course make a bigger name for themselves like Ai Weiwei and so on by some of the things that he's done and uh, but uh, but it's it's just and it's interesting to have conversations with artists over there uh, about uh, their experiences and what knowing what they can do and what they can't do and uh, Juan Lea, uh, who's doing very, uh, I think, some pretty avant-garde things from time to time, but he'll say, you know, I'll be in the studio and say, well, you know, I can show all of these, but I did this over here, and this I might think about whether I would put that into a museum show yet or not. So, you know, they still have some restrictions. I think uh, 
politics are something best left to Lansing and D.C. for those of us who live up here. Uh, you know, Traverse City has some, you know, nasty little infighting politics mm -hmm. going on. More power mm -hmm. to them. But uh, for those of us who live out here in the woods, I think, uh, you know, our biggest political thing is like the environment, you know, back to the environment. Um, you know, I mean, that, that's the most politically active I have ever been, has been with the Friends of the Jordan, Friends of the Cedar, these other, you know, organizations to protect what we got because, what, 15 years ago the gas wells came into this area after raping the pigeon and we, we, we lost the war but we won some battles, we got spacing, and now the frackers are coming in, so... Mm -hmm. What are we going to do, you know, because it's way above politics. This is, you know, it's just common sense, but politics is the only way it's going to happen. What can we really do effectually right here in this tiny little community that's going to make a drop of difference in Washington? I'd like to see somebody got an idea, I'll help, you know, but, you know, what we can do on a political level is what we can do to control our environment and the people that represent us right here, you know, on a, on a village to township to uh, state level. I think that's our responsibility. And um, I don't know if that has anything to do with art, but... Uh, yeah. Well, <laughs> I, would, I would argue that uh, you can be political as an artist and... Oh, yeah. And, 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 well, I've done and, political and, pieces yeah, right. in book and, form. But, what, stuff, where, but where I'm going is your responsibility in society to respond to what's going on mm -hmm. you know, politically has uh, less to do with you being an artist than being a citizen. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And so, yeah, where you might use uh, the arts to enhance, you Imagine know, an, a, an idea or a thought, your responsibility as a citizen uh, is is where politics come in, not because you're an artist. Right, exactly. We all have our own voices in mm -hmm. our art, you know, whether it be environmental, political, um, women's issues, you know. So I think that's, you know, we can be grouped in that label for everything. Right, that right. question for everything. I have this friend that I, w I was shocked by some of the vitriolic political stuff he, he, he was posting and sending out an email, mainly on Facebook, and totally opposed. And and I, I called him on some of the stuff, and um, and then there was the silence. And what the conversation went back to, it seemed like the only thing that we could communicate about was music. So he started sending me notes about you know blues and swing and stuff like that. So I'm mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is it is it bad of me to engage on that aspect and leave the other stuff alone? Because I, I have a feeling I would never change him, um, right. and I would, like I would get more yeah. riled up, probably. Um, I mean, if you so. like him, keep him as a friend. <laughs> yeah, I, you we're may not, not that. Well, well, friends, because I'm sure you'll disagree with somebody on something. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, well, but you know, it, you know, sort of getting back again to uh, our ability to communicate with the internet and to do so anonymously or you know, publicly if you want, but the amount of, uh, uh, and I was listening to a, a news story on, on the way up, driving up today about that, you know, we've become so uh, 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 fractured as a society into to political thinking that has become extreme because uh, uh, our ability to, to say what we want, either adding our name to it or not, is, is out there. And you can put anything out there and you can, and you can be uh, uh, um, pretty radical in terms of what you want to say. Uh, uh, and, and so it's, it's much more easier, much easier to be polarized. And perhaps we all had back in the, in the 40s or the 30s or the 40s, there was that same kind of thinking, but it didn't, it couldn't emerge to the surface the way it does. And so there was a, it was a, it was a more controlled or uh, 
uh, dialogue uh, within society uh, than we have now when everybody can sc scream and say every ridiculous thing they want to say or be really caustic or whatever. And so, you know, when you, you said, well, do I, do I continue to have a relationship with this person on things that, that we have in common? You know, that sort of struck me because I, I'm thinking, well, would I have would I have thought that 30 years ago, with uh, somebody that you know, I think you could have. I think it was easier to have disagreements with people, uh, and 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 not let it become, let, go to the extreme, of of uh, you know, well, they don't agree with me politically or or I don't agree with what they're saying here, so I can't have that conversation in another area. I don't know, it, it just seems like you know, we become more and more polarized, and so we take everything to the extreme, and we celebrate the extreme and everything. I mean, it's extreme sports, it's extreme food, it's extreme this, it's extreme that, and... Well, so art is kind of like, art or music is kind of like a universal language in terms of a neutralizing thing for you and your friend, and it's, maybe it kind of is for all of us. And is is there really rural art, or is is it? I mean, is there a rural, there's <coughs> art of the rural area, but when there are artists in a rural area, they might not be creating rural art. They might be creating worldly art. And so, really, is there a thing called rural art? Or, uh, but getting back to, but it, maybe it does have a role, you know, being you know, the locality of it at all. And I don't know, if we, have we answered that question very well, uh, the role of art in rural, the rural Northwest? Uh, rural community. It seems like we've covered a lot of, a lot of great things. Like it, that's actually a great question. We've just got a few minutes left. Maybe mm -hmm. that can be our final question. What is the role of art in rural communities? Not a quick question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Well, I don't. I don't know that it's any different than any place else. Right. I mean, whether you're whether you're in a rural community or whether you're in the city, you know, you're a human being. You 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 have emotions. You appreciate beauty, uh, or you find disgust in in some things, but. You know whether you're living in Chicago or you're living in in in, in uh, you know Elk Rapids or or wherever, uh, you respond to uh, art and 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 in music and so on. It, you know it's 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 part of your life. Now you may you may you may have a different attitude or a different approach, but uh, you know art is something that comes out of us as humans, whether we live here or anywhere else. So uh, I, you know, I don't, I don't know that there's really that much difference. The only difference between here and there is how long it takes us to get somewhere yeah. around. I yeah, mean, that's yeah. Well, you know, yeah. but you know, so so you said you said earlier, you know, and, and I drove out from Traverse City, and it took me what forty five minutes or whatever. So you live in the northern suburbs of Chicago, and you drive into the city, and it takes you an hour. Right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I had, I had, we have members at the museum that people that moved from Chicago and, and became members of the museum, and they said, you know, we love it here. There's just as much, and we can get to it faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, you can take public transportation from the outskirts in a lot of yes. places. Right, right. I, mean, I, I live in Harbor Springs now, so it's an hour and a half for us to get here. Right. And that's where we, I'm seeing that people cannot get to things. I mean, right. We talked about me Skyping in here mm -hmm. tonight in mm -hmm. order to take mm -hmm. part, and I think that's I'm having to Skype into um, my Michigan Filmmakers meeting that meets Wednesday nights mm -hmm. um, once a month in Traverse City. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it is a struggle to, at least for me, I'll just speak for me, to be connect, to remain connected. And mm -hmm. I would say, um, because I've lived here 10 years and have had a gallery and been active, I, I know I have a community of artists in this area. 
Um, but I think it's a struggle, and I think it's even more of a struggle for people that are living in the communities, maybe growing up in these communities, necessarily connecting with all of us who live out in the woods in these various places. I still think that's a struggle, and I think you know the art centers are do a good job going mm -hmm. to schools, but um, for me, that's it's the ac it's the access to things. Yeah, but again, you've made that decision. You made the decision to live in the woods. If you, you know, if you in quotation marks. Not everybody uh, has. Well, not everybody all right, has. But, I don't but, think no but, Chad, you know, when he was growing up, made the decision to, to live in Cadillac. You know, it's, no. it's made upon a right. lot of people. Right. You know, right. so it's. But but you also. The retirees retired. Right. And make but, that decision right. But he also he also went to Chicago <laughs> and came back here. You know, and, and, and uh, I guess is, is, I, I grew up in a, on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. Uh, and I went to school 30 miles, a university 30 miles from where I grew up, and I'd never been in the city before I went mm -hmm. to college. I might as well have been Paris in my life experience. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, you, uh, you know, whether you grow up in a, in a, in a rural area or, uh, or, or, you know, you go to a, a bigger city or whatever, it's a matter of, you know, at least I can only speak for myself, but I, but I think it's, it's a matter of having and taking the opportunity to, to connect and finding those opportunities to connect uh, uh, in, in, with the arts or with artists and so on that, uh, and, and you, may have a different, uh, you may have a different way of doing that in a, in a rural area as opposed to a city, but you still have to find the people, you still have to connect with them, and, you, you, and whether, you know, you still need the same kind of structure in some way or another to do that. I'm not and, speaking for right, myself. Right, I mean, I, right. you know, I'm one that goes out and finds people. I mean, right, I'm not speaking for right. myself, but I'm saying how do we ask, you know, how do we connect right. more? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. And as you say, you have to go mm -hmm. out and find things. We're, mm -hmm. we're putting the thing on that people are going to go out and find, mm -hmm. find mm -hmm. it. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I don't, I don't get very many people in my gallery that are from the community. Most mm -hmm. of the people that come to my ga gallery are people who are vacationing here, driving by from Chicago, from big cities, and they'll say, my, you know, I've, I've been out to Santa Fe, I've been here, your gallery is something we, we would never expect here. You know, your quality of work yeah. is, is what we see all over the place. I, but I don't, get, I don't get local people in. I hear the same story all the time, I mean, mm -hmm. in, yeah. in a different... And, and yeah, it, it's the same struggle. I mean, we've been open for 21 years, and, and we'll have people who walk in the museum who've lived here all their lives, and it's the first time that they've... You know, but, you know... When you're ready to make it, when, when you're ready to do it, you'll do it, and uh, and you know so it's. Uh, uh, I think we we put those opportunities there for people. Uh, when you're uh, in a bigger city, there are more people, probably more concentrated, who have that uh, that that interest. But on the other hand, if you if you if you take you know what's the percentage of people in rural Michigan who have an interest in the arts, and is it and you you take an urban population base is the is the percentage of people who have the interest the same? I it's think just so. that there are more of them. Yeah, yeah, it's per capita. In a, in a, I think it evens out. We got. I think There's just what, more elbow room between the right. creative people and the crazies. You know? <laughs> right. no, I think what Island is doing is is I'm trying to connect with people. Yeah. You know, taking exactly. this earth-based approach and integrating, you know, using, you know, canning mm -hmm. and introducing people mm -hmm. to the arts in a different way. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, a gallery, a lot of people won't come into a gallery, especially if you're a gallery in Harbor Springs. You know, you there's a certain expectation about who can who can access that? You know, you have to look a certain way in order to be, to walk through the door. Um, and I think that maybe it's make, making it seem friendlier, not a, you know, high pollutant mm -hmm. tootin mm -hmm. type of, a, mm -hmm. of, of a experience for people. Mm -hmm. You know, in the old days, you know, the, the 4-H and people would have arts, it would be through sewing or quilting, and it was, it was an experience that was for, it was known to be for everybody. Mm -hmm. And maybe that you know, I think just maybe talk a little bit 
because somebody on here might not know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, talk a little bit about how you're incorporating, you know, Island is trying to incorporate this arts and right. back to nature type stuff. Yeah, because Island has, like, started the outreach between the art, the art councils and, uh, you know, it sort of ties them together and goes beyond, so. <laughs> yeah, so, um, uh, <clears throat> I don't know exactly where to start, but, um, the, you know, one of, part of Island's mission is to um, revive and rejuvenate small communities, and uh, we strongly believe that uh, part of that process is through the arts. So um, <clears throat> something that we haven't been uh, a part of, but that's happened here in Bel Air that's been really magical is Dan Gorno teaches dance class at Shorts Brewing Company on Tuesday nights in the off season. And it seems like kind of a nothing like, well, that's like sweet mm -hmm. and fun. But out of that has grown this group of people and group of friends that are now so much more connected than they were before. And, and there's this community that's grown out of that uh, that wouldn't have happened without dance. Um, and those are the kinds of things that inspire us and um, that we try to recreate in our work. Um, through through everything that we do, and the, the you know the the connection between art and earth I think is timeless. It's it's um it's nothing new. It's certainly not something that that we made up. We're just trying to bring that to the surface again, so people can see that 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 there's a connection there. Um, and then and then um, we're also really interested in agriculture and. And homesteading, and there's not a farmer I know that's not involved in the arts in some way. They're not musicians or quilters or knitters or visual artists or um, sculptors. Um, to to a one, everybody I I met here has been connected to the arts. So um, I, I I don't think that we're doing anything new. We're just bringing some attention to it. I think that's that's really you know what's the op we might not have a, a different approach than other artists in cities, but being in a rural area has so many opportunities with the land, as you mentioned, and uh, and it, and it's really wonderful to think of you know our role as being you know, the arts being the seed to inspire people uh, to bring out their creativity and it seems like that's been really uh, a, a great you know little thing to explore for me I when I first moved here I wanted to do a show on sunflowers and I was trying to tie into the agriculture here with uh, the Send brothers who do all the sunflower fields uh, north and um, I got there's four brothers involved in, in all the properties I think it's about six acres uh, of sunflowers and I uh, painted their hands and had them stand with them all like this into a sunflower. And, uh, and what the best part of that experience was is they didn't think that they were creative. And, and I, I, I really, for them to participate in this was so uncomfortable. Not just the fact that they didn't want to do anything that was creative, but they didn't want to stand so close to each other. <laughs> they were really funny. But, uh, but in speaking with them, you know, we talked about some of the new things they were doing with their agriculture and some of the new products that they were doing. And I'm like, you guys are the most creative guys that I've run into in a long time. You just don't, you know, recognize it or see it. Mm -hmm. And um, that exchange with uh, farmer agriculture is all about it's all about creativity and because it's growing things out of the ground and 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 we all know that. But I always think the flip of the flip side that I always like to express is that uh, that artists uh, plant ideas and farmers paint landscapes because it kind of is what we both do. We have and we both we all work with our hands and the getting back to the hands and the earth and how that ties into rural 
you know, a rural row, a rural, rural roll. That's a rural <laughs> route. Mm-hmm. Um, and speaking of rural, rural, I keep thinking about roads and the, the importance of roads through our rural areas and um, what we can do with our roadside and farms. And uh, one project, and I don't want to get too far on a tangent, but if anyone's enthusiastic about this idea, I'll talk to you later, uh, that I thought would be great to tie um, uh, our agriculture and enterprise opportunities with agriculture with our artists is to do uh, some kind of a really great coordinated uh, farm roadside painted artistic uh, journey for people when they travel through uh, to all the different farm stands and all the different uh, farmers markets that there's these really great Americana uh, roadside uh, nostalgic kind of farm signs done, almost like um, you know a working core of artists to, to develop those and make it part of our tourism. I think that would be really cool. Like the old apple crates. Mm-hmm. That mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Well, it's after 8.30, oh. so it's time to wrap up. I want to really thank you all for coming tonight and sitting on the panel. I know at least a few of you drove a long way to get here. And uh, it's for us in Bel Air, it's nice to see the traffic coming this way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that way. Um, so I, I, I really appreciate it, and I'm so happy. To yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.